My name is PJ, and I run Arkansas Hedgehog Rescue. And I wanted to introduce you to Olivia. She is our most recent rescue and permanent resident. Um, you may be familiar with the, the name Olivia from my Olivia the Octopus um, top that I had just made. Um, at the time, she had just come into us and we really did not get to know her personality yet. Um, but one thing that she did, which I thought was so adorable, was she would grab all of the toys that were in her room, or her cage, <laughs> and uh, just grab them all and bring them into bed with her. So she just sort of scooped everything up and brought it in bed, even her food bowl. And so I thought that was a good name for an octopus with many arms so they can grab everything. So this is Olivia. Hello, darling. Hi, sweetheart. You can tell she's very squirmy. <laughs> she's very active. She came to us um, and we noticed that she had a very large front leg. Um, so of course I took her to the vet. We didn't know if it was soft tissue or if it was uh, something else. Um, so we put her on antibiotics for a, a week to see if, if the swelling would go down, and it did not. Um, so we made the decision to have that front leg amputated because it seemed to be getting a little worse, um, like uh, just a, a, a touch red. So, you know, we've been through that with Lolly when she came to us with a, a severe bone infection in her front leg. So. I did not want to take any chances. We went ahead and had the front leg amputated. So she's, um, you know, that's a difficult thing for an animal to have to go through is um, not just an amputation, but a front leg. They do really well with back legs being missing or having nubs or something, but the front leg is just um, a lot more cumbersome for them. So Lolly did great. She learned how to balance a little bit. Olivia is still figuring it out, but um, but she has healed now. So um, I didn't want to show her to you when she first came in because she was, you know, it was a little traumatic. And then I wanted to wait until after she healed because I, you know, I, she had stitches, and I I just didn't want to. I just wanted to go easy on her, you know. But so she cuddles with us. <laughs> She does settle down after a while. <laughs> um, she's a very, very sweet little girl. I mean, she hasn't balled up this whole time. She lets me kiss her anytime I want. Um, but she likes to be active. Um, and and she, is, she is making her way around the cage. I've seen evidence that she's been in her wheel. So she's, she's figuring it out. Um, She's got me a little worried right now just because she didn't eat last night on her own. And so I'm going to stop the footage right now and feed her. Um, I'm going to syringe feed her. I don't want to take any chances. So, so say goodbye. Oh, she's very vocal too. I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, anyway, okay. Bye, Olivia. I'm back. So, uh, thank you for watching, um, if you're watching. My name is PJ, like I said before. This is Knitting with Quills. Um, I've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> I'm, I've got a lot of exciting things that are happening for me. So, um, I'm gonna dive right in. Um, and first of all, I want to thank Corey from IROC Knits. Um, because she, A, watched my podcast, <laughs> and B, she reached out to me and um, helped with some suggestions, not only on the, on the podcast, but also on becoming a designer. So she gave me some lots of wonderful references, and I am taking it all, and I'm anything that anybody who knows what they're doing wants to share with me, I am wanting to absorb. 
So I know on my first episode, I was like, I'm not going to put much effort into this podcast and I'm not going to, you know, put much effort into designing. I'm just going to do them for free. Um, and, and I know anything that is worth doing is worth doing correctly. So I'm going to be um, striving to make this podcast better. Um, I will be working on the sound quality. I need to get a microphone, um, but I have a, a video camera that I'm working with, and so I, I need to figure that out. And if it's better to use my camera or my phone or my tablet, I'm gonna weed through all of that and figure it out. It might take me a little bit because I'm also trying to absorb all of this wonderful information on designing, writing patterns, sizing. I'm learning so much and I'm so excited. <clears throat> so, sorry about that. So thank you so much, Corey. Um, you are my mentor now. <laughs> no take backs. <laughs> um, I really appreciate it. And um, Hey Brownberry also reached out to me. She saw a podcast too, I guess. And um, um, she has some ideas for people uh, to help with um, sizing the patterns and um, proofreading them and all of that and test knitters and stuff too. So I am going to take every little bit of help that I can. I, I, really really appreciate it and I am going to do better and be better and I'm going to do this so I'm I am so super excited about it so um, I'm going to just jump in and tell you quickly some of the things that I've learned over the past couple weeks so and then I'll get into all of the fun stuff so um, one one of the things that um, you know, I, okay start over <laughs> So, um, in my quest for searching out how to find sizes, I did come across um, standards and guidelines for crochet and knitting. All right, this was awesome. Um, because I had, up to that point, no idea about what any other sizes were except for my own. Um, and this was great. It gave you from extra small to extra large, or to 5X, right? Um, but, and so what I did is I created my own little chart, because I noticed, you know, like for example, the 3X, their bust size go from 52 to 54. Well, that's like, that's two inches, that's quite a bit of difference. And that's gonna be the difference between, you know, 10, 12, 18 stitches, depending on, you know, your, your gauge. So I, I have to be more precise. I want the things that I design to be consistent. I want somebody when they, if they make something that I've designed and they, they like the way it fits, then they will have confidence that the next thing will also fit them well. So, so then I went through, what I did is I went through all these numbers and I just kind of picked the middle number. So if it was between 52 and 54, I did 53. I'm going to do small to, to 5X, um, you know, but just make the sizes a little bit more concise. So anyway, I went through and I did all of my own little calculations and everything. So. Uh, I chose what numbers are going to be my numbers for my designs. So, one of the things that Corey had recommended to me was Blueprint. There, were, there was a class on Blueprint of uh, how to write a knitting pattern, the words to use, how to make it simple, concise, and that was wonderful. I went through the whole thing and I, I, did, ex I did the homework, you know, she uh, gives you a, a pattern at the end, and so you are basically working with her on how to create this pattern. So, uh, and then then you come back and you compare it to wh what her instructions were, and so that was wonderful. And then of course after that, Blueprint like recommended this other program on grading, 
And so of course I jumped at that. And it was, it's wonderful. It is blowing my mind. Okay. Um, the pattern that this lady is using is crazy. <laughs> it's so difficult. I mean, it has everything in it. It has waist shaping. It has like a button band that's built in. That's not added later. It's built in. It, ha it has a stitch pattern in it and ribbing and like this extra little bit to add to the back. There's so much as far as calculations go for this. I mean, just the waist shaping calculations were one whole class of like an hour and a half. <laughs> so, um, but it's all the figures and the formulas and using Excel. The class that I'm taking with this lady is just, here it is, wonderful. Gita cardigan and is, is the cardigan that she was making and it's for um, Fena Goberstein. Anyway. Just the learning of the Excel is just mind-blowing and amazing and and, and learning how to make these calculations throughout these other sizes. Now, the other thing that, that I, I got from her, and this helped wonderfully, just so much, um, those things that I was missing from the other um, gauge, or the other sizing information, like the circumference of the arm and wrist and neck and shoulder, and all of that, she has, she has this whole thing. But this is sizes 32 to 64. And each size, of course, that is the bust size that she uses, okay, or that this chart uses, that is the size. So size 14 is size 14. Well, not size 14. Size 34 is a size 34 bust, okay. But that leads me to something else, size 14. We have these three different measurements. I mean, we have these. So you could be a medium, and you could be a size 10, and you could be a 36. That's why it's so confusing, I think. Um, I am so relieved now, and it's, I'm so excited because now that I have my figures, I can begin. So now I just have to learn how to how to do it. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too long. I'm I am so excited. Um, I'm doing this this grading along with this um, along with um, Fena, <laughs> this designer. I'm doing this along with her so that I'm learning it. I'm doing the Excel. And then once I get take this class, then I think I will feel confident enough to be able to release a pattern that's written better and graded. And, and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm very excited about it. Okay, I'm back. Um, one of the suggestions that Corey had for me for the podcast was to like break things up a little bit to make it easier to edit um, and to like not be so long-winded. <laughs> so anyway, I'm trying. Um, I want to show what I'm wearing, my finished object. Here we go. This is, I think she's going to be named Whimsy. <laughs> Whimsy. Um, this is from sock yarn that I got from a friend in Utah. Um, so it's wool, but it's it's sock yarn. This is Zeno sock yarn. Anyway, and I got some crazy calculations for this, buddy. <laughs> anyway, like this is my this is my worksheet. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy pants. So I saw this beautiful beautiful design um, on Pinterest and when I went to Ravelry to look at it there was no pattern and it was so cool looking and I thought well 
let's, I got this self-striping sock yarn, let's, you know, play with it, see if I can come up with something on my own. Um, that one had, I don't know how many, I didn't see the back, I don't know how many triangles it had, but I figured you could just, you know, I, I took a, uh, a measurement of, of, you know, the patterns that I like to make, how tall or how long and how wide, and basically it was 19 inches for each side and 22 inches for the front. And then I just um, cut that in half. I'll find it here. Okay, here we go. So I took those measurements and made a paper pattern. I've shown this before, all right, okay? And then I cut it in half. I was struggling um, with the decreases on each side, okay? Now some of them are a right triangle, and so there's only decreases on one side, and some of them are an acute triangle. So, and it's not, it's not in half. It's not even. So if you take the point, well actually if you fold it in half, anyway, one side decreases more than the other side or faster than the other side. So that had my head like, how, how do I figure this out? Um, so, in the past, I had gone to this website when I was searching for graph paper for knitting. Went to this website called incomptech.com, and I'll put, a, I'll put a link in the show notes. But that's what I used for my Olivia. Um, and a, and I, I sized it down so that I didn't have this big sheet of paper to, to work with. Um, but it wasn't a, until, again, Corey, <laughs> as I'm trying, as I'm struggling through trying to figure out how to do the decreases on this triangle, she, on her podcast a couple weeks back, she was having the same issue with the shawl. And so she um, pulled up the graph paper and that helped. And it clicked. It was like, so, I'm using a combination of this and the graph paper. I went back to that website and printed graph paper in gauge with, with what I'm knitting and clicked the little box that said actual size. And what that did was print out for me graph paper that is stitch for stitch exactly what I'm knitting. So, sorry about the paper. <laughs> okay, so I went through and I laid out my triangle and I figured out the decreases on each side. It was crazy. So for example, it gets a little complicated because, um, you know, for the acute triangle, like I said, the decreases were more on one side than the other. So for example, that's it, 56 stitches, 102 rows. And so how do you reduce 56 stitches to zero over 102 rows? And then on the other side, it was 74 stitches and the same 102 rows. So you have to work those at the same time. What I ended up with was um, basically I divided the rows in half because I really did not want to be decreasing on a purl row. So, um, so then I was left with 56 stitches over 50 knit rows. Well, that's a lot more doable. So that was pretty easy. Basically, every single knit row was reduced. And then um, in addition to that, there were some left over, right? Because 50 
six stitches over 51 rows. There's four stitches left that you've got to account for. So um, in addition to every knit row decreasing, I decreased one every 15 rows. An additional decrease every 14 rows, every 14 rows. So I did the same math on the other side. So 74 stitches decreased over 102 rows. Don't want to do every row, just the knit rows. So 72 stitches decreased over 51 rows. Again, that means every single knit row gets decreased. In addition to that, that leaves uh, what 23 rows or 23 st stitches left to decrease. So every four rows, I decreased again. So it's kind of like doing the neck um, decreases at the same time as you're doing the arm decreases. But that was an epiphany that was awesome. And a thank you, Corey, because that little, that little bit helped me with my own problem. It helped me click this. And it occurred to me too, you can do all the shapes, all the shapes. Okay, so after, after I did this, um, I was thinking triangles, I want all these triangles. I had, I had like 20 different pattern ideas using triangles because now I can figure out how to do them. And then um, I was like, you can do all the shapes. Like there's nothing you can't do. Like all the shapes, right? Anything, anything you can think of. I have the pattern for that now, right? I can turn this, I can turn the thought into a picture, into a pattern. Anyway, I am so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay, I'm gonna pause again. <laughs> I'm done with this, but I'm still working on the pattern, which I won't actually finish until I finish taking this class on sizing, uh, grading and stuff. So, um, but this will be a pattern. And originally I was just gonna do um, just sleeveless, and I had left over, so, I weighed it and it was, you know, I don't know how much it was, but anyway, I weighed it and I thought, well, I can do sleeves and of course I'm going to do the sleeves two different directions as well. So I started with this one and I did not know how big I was going to make the sleeve. It sort of depended on how much was left. And so I just knit, knit, knit until I got to half of the weight and then bound off, measured it, determined how many rows to cast on for this one, and then did it. So anyway, it turned in two balls or skeins or two balls of sock yarn. Two balls. That's it. Anyway, I wore it today um, and I I got lots and lots of compliments, so um, I really, really like it. And I think that this could be something that would be really good for either those little skeins, like the 20 grams or the 10 grams. I think that'd be awesome for those to use those up or leftovers from other projects, you know, because you just stripe, you just stripe, whatever. It could be any stripes, any colors or self, like, like I used self-striping sock yarn. I would never buy self-striping sock yarn, probably, because I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't know. But if I did, <laughs> I would use it for this. Anyway, I'm so excited about that. So, on to something else. My next finished object is my Roselle tea. So I did the knit along for with Patty Lyons and um, you know from last episode if you watched it I learned a lot. I'm trying to be more flexible and and listen and pay attention and learn and not dive in and you know so I after 
several attempts, I finally got the gauge right. Used to change my yarn. I love this. I love the color. It's so cute. So I did do a couple adjustments. Um, I did not add the fold for the, the lace section here. I enjoyed learning how to read a knitting pattern. That, you know, one of these, that was very helpful to me. Um, I would not have figured that on my own, what all these dots mean and that you add these to get the length and all of that and, and how just by looking at a picture you have the pattern. I told you that I had used the ice yarn from Turkey to make this. I only used half of it. So this cost me six dollars. I only used half. I can make a whole nother top. So another finished object and finished design. And if I get my act together, it will be released when I release this video is Kayak the Ambassador tie for my husband. So I made, as I mentioned before, um, you know, there's not much that he's interested in me knitting for him, but I knew there would be silk yarn at the Dallas-Fort Worth Fiber Festival. And I thought, you know, silk tie, right? Let's, let's do that because, you know, he wears a tie several times a week. Um, so anyway, I got this beautiful yarn and it is from Redfish Dye Works. And um, very pretty. So um, I got forward to making it. I was thinking that I would knit, knit it into fabric basically and then construct the tie from there. Do a little sewing and that is what I did and that worked. So, sorry for the crumbling again. <laughs> now that I know how to use this this um, chart, <laughs> I basically just uh, mapped out a whole tie. <laughs> it's crazy. So, I I did that. I took one of his ties, laid it out, traced around it, and then um, and then figured the, you know, what the what I what I needed to make extra in order to sew it together. So, um, so I love it. I love how it turned out. Um, and he likes it. He wore it the next day after I finished it, and. Um, got some compliments from people and whenever somebody found out that I had knit it for him they would go over to him and <laughs> immediately they just grabbed the tie and was looking at it and he's like yes this is completely normal please touch my tie <laughs> so but anyway um, so I did a an interfacing on the inside um, notes for the future I would use something uh, even weightier than what I did. Um, I was nervous about it being too heavy or stiff and so um, I, I used something that was pretty pretty light but um, it needs a little bit more structure. After wearing it the first time um, you know it did kind of get a little wonky um, but I could just press that out. Um, you know, it's worth it, I think. If I have to press it every time he wears it, that's fine. Because that means he wore it. And that makes me very happy and I'm going to cry again. <laughs> so, um, anyway. That's called Kayak the Ambassador. And, oh, here's my schematics for it. <laughs> Look at me! <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, that's called Kayak the Ambassador, and Kayak Kayak 
kayak was our first real rescue. Um, he came to us as a sick little baby. Hooplaha, I think. They like to do um, motivational videos and uplifting things, you know, just positive things. And so they wanted to, they reached out and wanted to do a video of some, some hedgehog rescue that was a positive, had a positive turnout. And of course they referred him to us. And so they came and did a video with kayak and I put his little, I put his little um, cape on him and got out the little skateboard. He was so cute. Um, and so then after that, in that video, it didn't go viral, but it had uh, close to a couple hundred thousand views. And so our local Channel 11 came out and did a little spiel on him. And he was in the newspaper and he was in a magazine, a couple magazines. And this is a few years back. Um, so he, he really helped all of the rescues, all of the hedgehog rescues, um, because he he was this this face in front of people saying, "Hey, this is a thing. <laughs> there there are rescues for um, for hedgehogs, and there are people that are helping them." So um, it was a wonderful experience. He was a a wonderful, precious, my ultimate favorite little man. And um, I'm going to cry again. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm done with finished objects. I'll go to things that I'm currently working on. And the first one is Pepper the Ballerina. So I've got this uh, another video on my other channel, Ar Arkansas Hedgehog Rescue, and it is of our three little girls at the time, Pepper, Frappy, and Coco. And I, 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 I know, I'm crazy. I put them all in tutus and, and played Beyonce's Single Ladies, so I'll link that, I guess. <laughs> anyway. So this one's named after Pepper because she had a tutu on. So this is kind of what I'm thinking. That's how I um, got Chicken Coop Dye Works. Okay, and that is this beautiful. It's got little green speckles in it, right? And those green speckles go. Actually, yeah, those green speckles go with the Chasing Rabbits olive. That is the main color. I will most likely have to purchase another skein from Chasing Rabbits so that I can have enough for the back. I understand. I accept. Okay, I... If that's what I have to do, then I will do that. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to just use what I have. But I have a whole front to get to before I have to make any decisions. So um, anyway, so that's one thing that I am currently working on. And another thing. Oh, so beautiful. So beautiful. This, um, is a thing for string on the galaxy colorway so i am going to name this pattern rescue riches because it forms diamonds and lovely side note the uh all the yarn is all beautiful jewel tones um but you know every single animal that has come to us, has been a little treasure, has been a little diamond. And so each one of these diamonds would represent one of them. Lastly, lastly, look at this. These are mulberries. 
this is what we got yesterday. Just yesterday, <laughs> just yesterday. Our mulberry tree is about six years old. Last year it started producing and I would get a handful every day. And this year it is crazy. Producing crazy, it's awesome. So after this podcast, I am going to go make some cobbler and jelly and um, and just have fun in the kitchen for the rest of the day preparing for next week so I think that's it there's I recorded a little something earlier I'll put that here at the end um because I said I wasn't going to do a thing but I did a thing and I don't know how it's going to turn out but we'll find out thank you very much for putting up with me hello I just wanted to uh, take a minute to show you my mulberry tree. Um, here it is. It's a big, beautiful tree. It's uh, about five or six years old. And if you can see, it's already got tons and tons of mulberries. So, why do I bring that up? Because, um, Silkworms eat mulberry leaves, and since we have the mulberry tree, I can have silkworms. Um, and so, when we went to the Dallas Fort Worth Fiber Fest, um, you know they they had all the the life cycle of the of the silkworms and everything. And um, um, unfortunately, what they did was they baked the cocoons which killed the silkworms and um, and then they harvested the silk so I was hoping that there would be um, a better way to do that to take care of that um, I don't have a problem with you know having them perish as long as they're being used for something and for me that would be as a treat for the hedgehogs um, so I ordered some this is from Flourishing Filaments, and um, she uh, has a way of harvesting the cocoons from inside of the silkworm cocoon thing. <laughs> it's like a cocoon within a cocoon. I don't know what it is. But um, the pupae, she harvests the pupae from the cocoon, I guess would, would be how you would say that, um, and keeps them alive. And of course, she breeds them, and um, and you can get the uh, silkworm eggs online from her so they come in a variety of colors some of them were like a light pink some were like a light mint color so I got a mixture and I'm excited to see what we end up with this is just an experiment because because I have things available to me so um, the mulberry tree is getting ready to ripen and this is my first ripe mulberry of the season so they're pretty big not bad um, so anyway um, I'm very thrilled not only with this this tree because it's um, about six years old now and last year it started producing pretty well and this year it's we're going to have a, a bumper crop <laughs> so very pleased with that and then being able to have sil silkworms just takes me over the edge. So I'm thrilled with it. I just wanted to share that with you very quickly. Thanks.